Hydatid disease is also known as cystic echinococcosis, and it is caused by a parasitic tapeworm, Echinococcus granulosus, and these nasty little tapeworms grow in the small intestine of the definitive hosts and reproduction is asexual. Worldwide, hydatid disease affects between 2 and 3 million people. Intermediate hosts for hydatid disease are animals such as sheep, camels and moose. And it is areas where there are lots of these animals that have the highest incidence of hydatid disease. For example, Australia, New Zealand, China, the Mediterranean, South America, Canada and Alaska. The definitive hosts are dogs, foxes, wolves and jackals. And humans are accidental intermediate hosts. And this is a piece of liver containing a hydatid cyst. In order to understand the biology and pathology of hydatid disease, it is worth knowing what the different terminology means. The term hydatid is descriptive of a watery vesicle. A scolex, or the plural is scolices, is the attachment organ or head of a tapeworm and the precursor of a scolex is known as a protoscolex. The large hydatid cyst may be referred to as a mother cyst or mother cysts and these contain daughter cysts and these are produced from the germinal layer of the mother cyst and if the daughter cyst contains protoscolices and scolices this is known as a brood capsule. Very briefly the germinal layer of the hydatid cyst and daughter cysts produce the protoscolex and protoscolices. These develop into scolices. These develop into adult tapeworms. The final segment of the adult tapeworm, which is composed of three segments, breaks off to produce embryonated eggs. And these embryonated eggs develop into onchospheres. And the onchospheres develop into hydatid cysts. Hydatid cysts are usually 10 to 20 centimetres in diameter and sometimes up to around 30 centimetres in diameter and they contain colourless to pale yellow fluid and within the fluid are daughter cysts and brood capsules and protoscolices. The structure of a hydatid cyst is as follows. There is an inner nucleated germinal layer. It is this that gives rise to the protoscolices, daughter cysts and brood capsules. This layer is surrounded by an acellular chitinous laminated layer and this layer is surrounded by granulation tissue or a fibrous capsule. And over time, the cyst may die and then calcify. Transmission of hydatid disease starts off with the definitive host, uh, that is a dog for example, eating contaminated meat or offal. So that would be, um, say, a liver containing a hydatid cyst from an infected animal such as a sheep. The swallowed cysts burst and the tapeworm heads travel to the gut and attach themselves to the intestinal mucosa. Then the tapeworms are mature after about six weeks and each mature worm grows and sheds the last segment of its body about every two weeks and it is the last segment that contains immature eggs and the eggs are then passed in the faeces and the grazing animals such as sheep or kangaroos or moose may ingest the eggs while grazing. And of course humans are no exception as they are also intermediate hosts and they may too ingest eggs from contaminated fingers or food. And once ingested the eggs develop into onchospheres that enter the liver via the portal vein and around 75% of hydatid cysts arise in the liver, usually the right lobe, but a smaller proportion, 5 to 15 percent, may occur in the lungs and hydatid cysts can occur elsewhere in the body such as the bones, brain, 
kidneys, etc. Clinically, high dose disease may present with varying symptoms depending on the location of the cysts. So, for example, if the liver is affected, as it is in the majority of cases, presenting symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, and possibly portal hypertension. If the cysts are in the lung or lungs, then this may present with cough, chest pain, and shortness of breath. If the cysts develop in the brain, this can cause headache, vomiting, and epilepsy. More general symptoms include anorexia, weight loss, the presence of a mass, or there may be no symptoms at all. The big danger in high dotted disease is rupture of a cyst. And if this happens, it may cause fever, urticaria, or sometimes anaphylactic shock that can lead to death. And of course, if the patient survives the cyst rupture, the rupture itself will cause spread of the disease elsewhere. Treatment for high dotted disease includes just watching and waiting. Drugs for treating the disease include mebendazole, but that has largely been replaced by albendazole that is rather more effective. Other treatments include surgical removal of the cyst and aspiration of the cyst. Here is the gross appearance of a high dotted cyst and it is 20 centimeters in diameter. Here is a high dotted cyst in the brain. This is the low power histological appearance of a high dotted cyst. On the left side you can see a laminated acellular layer and on the right side of the picture are the brood capsules, these are daughter cysts containing protoscolices. And here is a higher power view of protoscolices and scolices. And the scolices, when ingested by the definitive host, will attach to the gut lining and develop into adult tapeworms. And this is the histology of a liver that contains a healed hydatid cyst. So the left side of the picture is liver parenchyma and on the right is a cellular fibrous cyst wall. Yeah.